has a little bit of history to it. Some of you may have seen me present on something similar or, or a, um, a narrower version of this presentation in Canberra. Um, it's something that I've been thinking about uh, for some years. Um, I'll start off with some background to the HSC code. I'll talk about its implementation for those who aren't familiar with it. Um, and the importance of the general requirements provisions that are in there. I'll talk also about some amendments that have come through uh, largely in 2000 and 2008, but there have been a few others as well. Um, and then we move on to the changes that I think need to be made to the code now. The sources of those amendments, um, and then I go through them, those sources in, in detail, talking about amendments coming out of the current SOLAS text, amendments to extend the application uh, of the code from uh, where it is at present, suggested changes to the general requirements, um, suggestions for overcoming a problem that we had with regard to raking damage stability. Um, there are some particular problems that apply to the application of the code to military and industrial personnel vessels. Um, and going beyond the HSC code itself, and uh, I was talking to Owen before we started about um, uh, the Energy Efficiency Design Index. It's not part of the code, but it, it's got to be related to the code in that um, it's a major danger to the relevance of the code uh, if it's applied to these vessels, to high-speed craft, and then we'll go through some con conclusions. Um, my involvement with high-speed craft began when um, our friend Mr Clifford in Tasmania built this vessel, which I think is the Hover Speed Great Britain. And this is the welcome that it got um, in New York before it did its transatlantic crossing, which earned it for the time being anyway. It's, it's blue ribboned. It was the first of the big um, cats, wave piercing cats, uh, built in Australia. Uh, and I should say that most of the, nearly all of the photos that I have in this presentation have come off the INCAT website um, because they've been very good in making a lot of their photos free of copyright and so on. Um, there's one that didn't and I got permission from Austell to include it in the presentation. Um, the HSC code itself started off not as a separate code but as an update of the Code of Safety for Dynamically Supported Craft of 1977. But the problem with that DSC code, as we call it, was that it was voluntary. It didn't have to be accepted under SOLAS. Craft certified in accordance with that code didn't have to be accepted. And in fact, when that hover speed Great Britain arrived in Britain, the MCA in the UK went through it with a dose of salts and said we're not accepting this certification um, and everything that doesn't comply with SOLAS has to be spelt out and uh, the equivalents uh, determined on a case-by-case -case basis. So it was fairly important that the HSC code when we put it together um, became part of SOLAS so it was part of international law and it was accepted internationally. Um, and the change from dynamically supported to high speed craft um, extended the application from hydrofoils and planing craft to include things like wave piercing catamarans which aren't necessarily dynamically supported. Uh, swaths are another case in point. Um, another thing that we had facing us at the time was that there was a limit of 450 passengers on the size of these vessels and that was commercially being hit regularly. It was a barrier to further development of these vessels so we had to find a way of getting past that 450 passenger limit. 
um, in a responsible manner. And I'll keep coming back to this throughout this presentation. The HSC code is essentially a code for high-speed, lightweight passenger ferries. It's not generally applicable to high-speed craft. Um, it takes account of a number of safety factors inherent in short sea voyages of high-speed ferries um, to enable it to reduce weight, increase speed, and so on. Those factors uh, in reducing weight are reducing safety equipment, taking account of the operational area, the search and rescue facilities that are in that limited operational area, whether they be fishing boats, whether they be passing traffic that is in that, uh, well, adjacent to that route and can be called in, in the case of an emergency, to assist the vessels. Um, structural materials, Solus requires steel or equivalent material, and that equivalence is based on fire. Um, so if it's equivalent, it could be aluminium, protected against fire for a limited time uh, to make it equivalent to steel. And rather than being a go anywhere code, the HSC code limits vertical accelerations according to the sea state. So there are operational limitations that reduce the loads on the vessel and therefore reduce the scantlings that are required on the vessel and so reduce the weight and allow them to go fast. Um, so this operational limitation here carries through into what we call a permit to operate. When a vessel is certified under the HSC code, it is certified with two documents rather than one. There's a certificate of survey for high-speed craft, and there's a permit to operate for high-speed craft. And it includes the operational limitations as well. Um, I was deeply involved, sort of representing the Australian industry to try and get this going. Um, this was back in the early 90s, um, and I convened and chaired a number of working drafting correspondence groups that um, actually put the code together. When it comes to its implementation, it's imp implemented through SOLAS Chapter 10, uh, which certifies that a craft that is constructed and equipped in accordance with the code satisfies um, the requirements of, of various requirements of chapters of SOLAS, in particular chapter 2.1 um, on general structure and um, construction, chapter 2.2 two on fire protection, chapter 3 on life saving appliances. Um, the radio requirements are just taken from SOLAS. Um, and certain life-saving equipment or, or, or shipboard equipment is also um, taken as, as, as meeting standards of certain regulations in SOLAS um, through SOLAS Chapter 10. There are pressures um, for using the HSC code for other vessel types. And as we will see as we go through this presentation, a number of military craft have been built which, and, and operated um, based on the HSC code. I wouldn't say you know, based on full compliance with the HSC code. That's, that's something that I don't have enough detail on and they're probably proprietary to the military's concern. But um, they certainly have, the code certainly has been built uh, used for military craft. Um, and the other thing that's coming up at the moment is that IMO is looking at things 
like uh, wind farm service vessels where the people who have been carried on board are not really passengers because they're being they're, they're physically able they've been carried out to do work on wind farm or on offshore installations of some sort or other and they're actually being transported and maybe accommodated um, to do that work uh, but um, at the moment there is a, a problem within Solus about what is crew and what is passengers and where these industrial personnel fit within those definitions in Solus and that, that's ongoing. Um, The problems generally is with these general requirements of the code, which I'll, I'll detail in a minute. Um, the code is not synonymous with class society rules, whatever class societies might want to tell you, or <coughs> whether they want to tell you it is or not, it is not synonymous with class society rules, it, it builds on class society rules such as the D and D GL high speed light craft rules. Um, and the last thing I wanted to point out is that there's a requirement in the code that it be updated every five years to take account of the sorts of things that I'll be talking about later in this, this presentation. But the last substantial amendment is ten years ago now. So that's slipped way behind and uh, the next amendment of course hasn't started yet and uh, what I'm trying to do with this presentation is point out the need to start that amendment. Now these are the general requirements that are in chapter one of, of the HSC code and this is, applies to all craft to which the code applies. The code must be applied in its entirety. You can't shop between one chapter of Solus and one chapter of the HSC code and say I'll comply with one and not the other. There's no forum shopping, you either comply with the code or you don't comply. Full stop. The code was developed at a time when we didn't yet have the ISM code in force and we felt in writing the code that we needed a quality management system for its operation and so that's written into the code but as it turned out quality management system was written into Solus at exactly the same time as the HSC code came into effect. Um, there's a type qualification requirement for the operating crew that they have all the training necessary to operate a particular craft just as there's a type requirement for aircraft crew, for example. Um, operational limits restrict operational areas and the worst intended conditions. This covers two aspects. Firstly, the prevailing weather conditions in a particular operational area. Say Bass Strait, for example, the propensity to get westerly fronts come through there, uh, the prevailing winds through there, the possibilities of um, in the event of an evacuation, uh, people in life rafts getting swept onto lee shores and what have you, uh, and the possibility of also being able to pick them up before that happens. The worst intended conditions are generally related to the, uh, the loading on the vessel, the slamming conditions, the speed, wave height, uh, limit curve which is imposed by the class society. Um, it's also assumed, contrary to Solus, that the craft is always in reasonable proximity to a place of refuge um, and that local area has adequate support facilities in terms of comms, forecasts, weather forecast, maintenance, sea forecast, whatever. Suitable rescue facilities, um, 
protection of areas of high fire risk um, included in the code. Provision, the code has provision for rapid and safe evacuation into survival craft. Um, there's also a requirement in the code for design for collision. So the seats that passengers use have to be designed for collision because it, at the time of the formulation of this code, it was straight after it, there'd been a major catastrophe in Norway where a, um, um, a high-speed ferry hit a, an island in the death of night, a very dark night, and um, all of the passenger accommodation concertinaed up with the passengers at the front end of that passenger space. So the seats have to be designed for collision and if there's any um, dangerous navigational circumstance the master has to have the option of requiring all passengers to go to their intended seats which are all approved for the uh, for design against collision. Um, there is no enclosed sleeping berths for, for passengers. It's assumed that all passenger spaces are open so that early detection of fire uh, in particular in those passenger spaces will have a lot of, will have Two nostrils, two ears, two eyes of every passenger that's in that space potentially picking that up, giving early warning of um, fire in that space. Um, with regard to crew, it was left a little bit open because um, quite often with high speed craft they may be in a foreign port overnighting. The crew will bunk down after the last run of the day and uh, get some rest before the, the, the first run of the following day. Um, now, this provision allowing for crew sleeping berths uh, is not a restriction, and uh, because it's not a restriction, it was a permission. It was actually deleted in 2008. Um, but it's part of the philosophy underpinning the HSC code in the first place anyway. This doesn't come so up so well, but this is a typical passenger space designed in accordance with that philosophy. Um, it's open, plenty of passengers there. If anything happens in there, everyone's going to know about it fairly quickly. As I mentioned at the start, the code was originally adopted and implemented through Souls Chapter 10 in 1994 supposed to be reviewed every five years. Um, the major review that happened was in 2000 where um, we had to respond to the Saint Malo uh, disaster near Corbiere in the English Channel um, and introduced breaking damage requirements. Um, this was done with a lot of assistance and a lot of calculations by the Australian high speed craft building industry and at the moment it's impossible uh, to build a vessel to meet those requirements if it's under about 40 metres in length. Um, that hasn't been a problem up till now but if you're looking at for example industrial personnel vessels it is going to be a problem and something will have to be done about it. To give you an idea of the sorts of things that were looked at 
in trying to get vessels under 40 metres length to comply. They were looking at putting double bottoms, for example, in the jet rooms of high-speed craft. Um, and even that wasn't satisfactory in providing enough protection against damage to enable them to comply. Um, the 2008 amendments were a thorough review, uh, general updating, and so on. Now this is, um, I think, uh, the American, well, the, the NCAT built vessel Swift, um, which was uh, the third of three NCAT boats that was chartered by the US Armed Forces and um, to prove the concept and uh, it's it's now been returned to INCAT, it's off charter, well it has been off charter and it's um, uh, operating elsewhere as a civilian vessel I think. Um, but it certainly proved the concept. So in terms of naval craft, <coughs> Solus excludes ships of war and troop ships. Similarly, the HSC code excludes craft of war and troop craft. Um, but as you'll see from this slide, I understand that the code has been used for many vessels um, that have been in service with, with militaries of, of um, various countries. HMAS Jarvis Bay was was a civilian vessel when it was taken into RAN charter um, and used as the um, um, East Timor Ferry for a period. The Westpac Express was purpose built um, by Austal for operation um, in Okinawa, um, transporting US Marines. And it, it's only in the past year or so that it's been taken out of service and uh, replaced by the Hawaiian Super Ferry, one of the failed Hawaiian Super Ferries. Um, I've mentioned previously the three <coughs> vessels built by NCAT specifically for the um, for service in the US Armed Forces, Joint Venture Spearhead and Swift. Um, the Armadale class I would say were probably not built to the HSC code as such, but they were built by a builder who effectively only built to the built to the HSC code. Uh, and they were built to the DNVGL rules, which as I've said earlier, don't necessarily reflect the HSC code. Um, and latterly, of course, you've got the um, products from Austral USA, their ind independence class trimarans, literal combat ship, and their spearhead class joint high-speed vessels, which uh, largely reflect the type of vessel that, um, or type of configuration that the US had with these three vessels here. Um, so as I've said here, the, these vessels may have been constructed to class rules without necessarily addressing the, the problems in achieving full compliance with the HSC code requirements. Um, very grainy, sorry about that, but that's Jarvis Bay in naval livery. Um, so since the code has been developed, there's been a number of things that mean that it, it really does need to be amended at the moment. Um, Solus has not been static in the intervening period. It's Safety standards in a number of areas have been improved. For example, there are safety requirements for passenger vessels for safe return to port. 
they don't ap appear in the HSC code. They might not have to appear in the HSC code, particularly for catamarans, in that they've generally got engined in both holes. But Solus has moved on, so it should, needs to be re-examined. Um, Solus has introduced evacuation performance standards for passenger vessels. You've probably seen the simulations where red dots appear out of cabins and they wander down passageways and make decisions according to the algorithm as to whether they're going to double back on themselves or whether they're going to go with the flow or whatever. But that applies to all passenger vessels. I think it should also apply to high speed craft if they go away from the open passenger space configuration that is at the heart of the HSC code. Um, they need to have a look at the ongoing validity of those 12 general requirements and in particular how some of them might be addressed without making them general requirements so that the application of the code can be broadened. Particularly to military vessels but I'll talk about that later on. Um, the 40 metre lower length limit from raking damage is, is, is definitely a problem. We knew it when those amendments were adopted but no one was building 40 metre and below vessels at the time so it wasn't taken as a, as a problem. But when you consider the small numbers of people that are going to be going out servicing wind farms, um, for example, this one person climbing up the, um, the pillar of a wind farm uh, at a time. Um, they're not going to be terribly big vessels. They're not going to be carrying a lot of people. They're not going to be actually at the wind farm all the time. So a lot of them are going to be below that 40 metre limit. Um, and I'll talk in a minute about military and industrial personnel vessels and the, the way that the code needs to be changed uh, to um, be applicable to those vessels. Um, and I'll also talk about, um, as I mentioned at the outset, MARPOL Annex 6 EEDI requirements. Um, which, which have big implications for high speed craft. Now, the, the main requirement here is that since the uh, code was adopted, SOLAS itself has been amended. So it is, is a requirement of SOLAS that a vessel be designed <coughs> and constructed in accordance with the requirements of a recognised class society. Um, this, what, this wasn't in the in Solus at the time that we wrote the HSC code um, and so the, the HSC code doesn't specify a class but it was thought at the time that any authority that took it upon itself to approve such a complex structure as a, as a high speed craft uh, was was only buying legal problems for itself if they did that without the advice of, of an authority such as a class society. Um, so that need that does need to be fixed. Um, I've got a bit of a personal um, issue which I've spoken to Seraph about um, with regard to the implementation of the speed and wave height requirements. I think that may have been a problem um, with, with the uh, cracking problems that the Armadales had. Um, so guidelines might be needed to get a bit of bit more uniformity and, and avoid outlying interpretations being made by class societies in particular in relation to that because they are businesses and they do need to um, uh, not impede the flow of work into their books. Um, 
safety management, well that's covered by Solace Chapter 9, so that can that can be scrubbed out of the code. Um, at the moment there should be no birth accommodation to speak of. But some of the offshore industry work vessels that come into Australia, such as to lay pipeline, flexible pipelines in oil fields and what have you, they're, they're big vessels. They're, they carry up to uh, about 200 personnel, most of whom are doing the work on the offshore side rather than um, working uh, on, the, on the, just the running of the ship as a, as a navigating unit. So if this code is to be applied to those sorts of vessels, they're obviously going to need berth accommodation rather than that, just open passenger uh, aircraft style passenger cabin, uh, which complicates all of those assumptions that I outlined before. So that needs to be addressed. Similarly with industrial personnel, if they're going to be fit to do their job on a wind farm pylon, for example, they need to be rested when they get to work. They're, going, they're not going to get adequate rest in an open passenger space like that. Um, so those passenger spaces have to be assessed against SOLAS passenger ship standards. Now, I don't care whether those industrial personnel are regarded as passengers or crew, but the fact is that there are no requirements in the HSC code as it stands to cover either passengers or crew in terms of berth accommodation. That needs to be fixed. Uh, I mentioned the SOLAS passenger ship requirements to cover safe return to port after an incident, be it a fire, collision, whatever. Um, that needs to be looked at as to whether they're incorporating it into the code or whether maybe the uh, relevant provisions out of SOLAS are, are called up in the code. But um, They are largely part of Chapter 2.2 the fire protection chapter of SOLAS, which the HSC code is supposed to cover. So one way or another, they need to be brought into line. And there may be other um, SOLAS amendments. I haven't been across every amendment as it's come through. Uh, so they may need to also be considered. Now this is uh, one of the INCAT vessels um, those three catamarans I mentioned <coughs> earlier um, operating in the Persian Gulf. This is, as I said, it's a photo taken directly off the um, INCAT website um, and uh, it's quite spectacular and it's quite interesting to see just how hard those, those vessels worked in the Gulf, in the Gulf War and apparently they, they went well up a number of the rivers in the Middle East during that Gulf War. In fact, they could go further up those rivers because of their light draft than uh, just about anything else, any other craft in the US military. To extend the application of the code, um, we need a, a number of amendments. Now, to bring the military side of this in, um, I was commissioned as a consultant by um, Rear Admiral Peter Marshall when he was HMO at DMO to prepare a, a paper on the potential application of the code to military vessels and that was went off to the uh, 2012 ship shipbuilding quadrilateral. I'm not quite sure where it went to may have just led to a bit of head-scratching, I don't know. But that was my involvement. Um, and uh, the work that I did there found that, an, I, I should say that Admiral Marshall and his, at least one of his successors have authorised me to go public on, on what we talked about there. Um, there were problems, as I outlined earlier, 
with the 12 general requirements. Um, mainly the assumption that the vessel constantly operates in a restricted area. Uh, military vessels generally can't be restricted, they need to be, you know, be able to go to most places. Um, and of course there's this berth accommodation problem. Um, I understand that with some of those military, US military vessels that the US military regarded the embarked personnel as cargo, so they could not be passengers. Self-unloading. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't think that was anything like the intent of, of the requirement. Uh, I don't think that's an appropriate interpretation, but that's just my opinion. Um, with the industrial personnel, um, we've talked about that being a, a legally complex area, um, and we've talked about the accommodation problem from that no berth passenger general requirement. Um, but when you consider the number, sorts of numbers of industrial personnel on a vessel that I, I've mentioned earlier, up to about 200, um, it's a long way from what we thought we were dealing with when we put together this so-called high-speed craft code, but it was a passenger ferry code with a very small number of crew. So that needs to be addressed. Um, and I think that all of the problems with the berth accommodation side of things could be resolved by calling up the solace <coughs> passenger ship requirements into the HSC code. Um, coming out of the industrial personnel proposals that have come through Europe, um, there was also a proposal to address this, uh, what I'm calling a 40 metre limit regarding raking damage stability and the way they wanted to do it was to fall back on the old assumption that um, uh, damage wouldn't happen um, between or over a, over a or in way of a transverse bulkhead. It's a rather farcical assumption which we got out of in the HSC code but if that was applied to the HSC code effectively that requirement um, would reduce the damage stability um, characteristics of this vessel below not only a passenger vessel but also below a cargo vessel according to the HSC code. So I'm suggesting that um, uh, with the first item there, the code should continue to be applied in its entirety. I'm suggesting that we could delete the second one about the quality management system. Um, I'm suggesting also that um, when we get down to this question of enclosed sleeping berths, that um, we delete the word no and we extend it to also apply to crew so that you're calling up Solus Chapter 2 to for all of those vessels. And I think that would address most problems. This is the uh, San Malo vessel after its raking damage incident. Um, as you can see, it's uh, quite a, an extreme attitude. Um, and um, some of the situations that passengers got into in getting off that vessel was, was actually quite extreme and way beyond what was envisaged in the HSC code. Um, well, obviously this raking damage question has to be addressed. Um, as I've, meant, uh, as I've mentioned, it, mentioned earlier, maybe we give them, bring it up to 45 metres length, 
to take off the requirements and how it should be done. I'm not making any particular proposals, but it, it certainly needs to be done. <coughs> this um, famous photograph of um, the Larrakia when it was on sea trials uh, has always given me some concern. Um, I believe that it should not have been allocated if it, if it was within the allocated sea state, that sea state is much greater than it should have been. I've got another vessel, uh, another picture, um, which was uh, when the vessel landed. And there is in fact a third picture. Um, and they're, they're all about two seconds apart, I would guess. The third one shows it effectively dead in the water when it landed from coming off that wave. But, are, you, are you saying the sea state uh, is too, uh, is greater than, uh, for, for a speed, or? It, I believe that that sea state is greater than it should have been. How it got to that stage, I don't know. I have my suspicions, but I don't know. But if it's subjected to the sorts of slamming loads that it will get when it lands after coming out of the water like that, I don't think it's terribly surprising that uh, there's been a lot of structural problems with those vessels. Now for military and IP vessels, firstly, the vessel would have to qualify as a high speed craft. It's got to have the required speed uh, for its displacement. Um, now, knowing how IMO works and knowing, going back to the exclusion of military vessels from solar and from the HSC code, I can't see IMO making any changes that would be specifically applicable to military vessels, but I think there are things that could be done to alleviate the problems for military vessels in applying the code to military vessels. Um, the problems for military vessels are that the craft can't always be in reasonable proximity to a place of refuge. Um, that's the way of life with military vessels. All of these are to do with that restriction of, of narrowing the operational area. But if those services can be provided by other vessels that it's operating in, in conjunction with, then it shouldn't be a problem. And I'm, I'm suggesting that military vessels um, in mutual support can get over those particular problems rather than be restricted to particular areas. Um, as I've mentioned, Solus Chapter 2.2 requirements to overcome the berth accommodation for passengers and crew. Um, not only in relation to fire, um, but there's also uh, problems with evacuation, um, which would be overcome by applying those solace requirements with regard to the evacuation modelling of the, of the uh, personnel from individual spaces. There's a problem also that comes with these vessels is food. Um, the HSC code assumes or provides for galleys for distribution of food. It does provide for, uh, provides for pantries distributing packaged food um, but um, I don't expect that military personnel or industrial personnel operating at sea for, for periods of time would survive very well on sandwiches or other packaged food. Um, 
and while the code actually applies, uh, allows for galleys, it's it's difficult. It's one area of difficulty of applying as a bog standard high speed craft <coughs> to an industrial personnel or a military application in providing food for them. Um, so you probably have to fit a proper galley to a vessel to, uh, to make it work properly. For example, this is a, a, a photo again from the MCAT site. Um, you may be able to see it better than I can close up, it's a bit grainy close up here. But you can see here the servery of the pantry. And you can also see the extractor fans above the uh, cooking equipment. There is some cooking equipment there um, and I'm sure that the builders push the rules as far as they can and having those spaces included uh, called pantries rather than galleys and have to have them properly fenced off and fire protected. But those are the sorts of things that need to be looked at. Okay, um, I've covered all of the issues with regard to the, um, the high speed craft code itself, but this is what I was mentioning earlier about the EDI. EDI, Energy Efficiency Design Index. Tony Armstrong has drawn this up from his own sources. This is the line that they are required to comply with and the dots indicate how far they missed that, that line. Um, <laughs> and this is for 30 high speed road packs catamarans currently in operation of between 30 and 40 knots. part of MARPOL and it's for rather than the HSC code, so I maybe shouldn't be talking about it at, in this presentation, but it's a problem. The, the standards that they're set on are based on conventional ships operating on international voyages. Um, and I personally was given an assurance when EDI was introduced that it wouldn't apply to high-speed craft. But the mechanism for excluding them is rather vague. Some people say because it's, there's no definition of high-speed craft and high-speed craft are <coughs> exempted. But other people say, well, actually, if some high-speed craft can fit into the definitions of roll-on, roll-off passenger craft, passenger vessels, for example. So they should be caught up. So far, I don't think they have. But the reasons why they shouldn't apply, and these, these are not all, uh, there may be others why, <coughs> it shouldn't apply is that HSC are lightweight and so their construction of itself doesn't consume so many resources. Um, their engines aren't on all the time. Not like those vessels on which the DI standards were based were on international voyages, chugging here, there and everywhere for days of, and months at a time. Um, engines are shut down for a large proportion of each day. Um, and although they're engaged in short voyages, they do a lot of them every day, so they're highly productive in the time that they are operating. Um, so in fact, if the DI was to apply to high speed craft, it could force those craft to become low speed craft or no speed craft mm -hmm. and put them out of business completely. Um, but as I say at the bottom there, I haven't observed any uh, sign of EDI reducing the market for high speed craft. But uh, it's just that one interpreter way interpretation of way of destroying the whole concept of high-speed craft. So 
Um, in conclusion, I'm glad, I'm sure you'll be glad to get to the end of this. The HSC code is due for, overdue for an update. Um, some of the assumptions underpinning the code are impeding its application to military vessels and IP vessels, um, as we've outlined. The code needs to be brought up, date, up to date with the developments in SOLAS. This raking damage problem is a real problem. And MARPOL EDI requirements present a threat to the very existence of high speed craft. Um, I've worked for AMSA a lot in the past 40 years. I've done a lot of things in IMO, but these are my own views and should not be taken as necessarily reflective of the views of AMSA or the IMO. Jesse. That was really good, thanks Rob. Um, just on the, the last um, points about the EEDI, um, was there's a lot of variables in calculating the EEDI. Is there any one of those that are pushing the, the iceberg craft so high above the, the limit? So is it if you want to go fast, you have to chew a lot of fuel. That's, That's all there is to it. Well, and just following on from that, of course, in many ways, the um, high-speed craft replace aircraft. I know that aircraft don't carry cars, but the people that would go on a holiday or, or do a, go on a ferry would go by aeroplane and rent a car. So in many cases, we're really talking about replacing aircraft, and of course, aircraft wouldn't even be on the, on the plot there. But that was, that was my question was really, you've made a very strong pitch to suggest that it's overdue for an update. So you're a really good salesman, because I think everybody in the room agrees with you, it's overdue for an update. But who, who is it that should do the update? I mean, it's easy to say it's IMO that should, but it's the countries that, that, are, that, that do that. I mean, is that you you're saying that the countries that design and build high-speed craft should, should do an up, you know, push for an update? Who, who, who does that? Well, it's done by IMO, and before any work is, is done by IMO, Someone has to propose that that work be done, and that requires a, a work program proposal to be put to IMO, and then it gets goes through the factory, and that itself has to be approved, and then it has to work its way through the, the process, and whoever proposes that work should be prepared to lead that work. And I think that may be a, a, a problem, um, because I'm retired, I'm no longer going to IMO, I, I, I can't do it. Um, and I'm not sure that there's all that much enthusiasm um, within AMSA to take it on, because the uh, uh, chairman of the Maritime Safety Committee um, at the moment is a, uh, at IMO, at the moment is an AMSA person, and uh, he doesn't want to necessarily lumber his, not only his committee with this work, but also um, have to find someone within Australia to lead that work. So I don't, I don't know how it's going to go. We, we may have to use the um, um, RINA safety committee to um, kick things along a bit, just as um, the RINA safety committee is kicking along the uh, the work that Richard Dunworth has done uh, on inclining experiments to drastically improve the, the uh, accuracy of those. Um, but um, there's a lot of hurdles to be gone through and it will take at least another five years before we get anything coming out of my proposal that it should be done. Or a major disaster. Any good catalysts to get energy stuff? Yeah, but you, you wouldn't wish for one. Absolutely not. Jesse. Uh, so you, you talked um, a fair bit there about the armor and showed the picture that's um, controversial. 
picture and stuff. I think what I have realised in the HSC is that there's also the, um, the permit to operate. Um, I think that's something that wasn't talked a lot about when we're talking about how it's the HSC applies to military applications and that they don't really hold themselves to operational limitations as well. Um, I guess I your thoughts on the um, permits to operate and how that might apply also to military applications. Uh, I suspect it doesn't, to be honest. The permit to operate is based around this limited area of operations or limited number of routes in a particular area. And the permit to operate has to be agreed by not only the flag state, but also the coastal states through which the vessel operates in that area. So that, you know, any environmental requirements that they might have as to how the vessel is to be operated in that area are all folded in. That's just an example, but you can't have someone sitting at the at a flag at convenience office in um, some nice place in the world <coughs> pumping out bits of paper that restrict what coastal states are bound to accept in relation to this vessel that the flag state effectively takes no responsibility for. So that's why there's this cross connection between the um, the flag and the coastal states for the permit to operate. But militaries tend to be a law under themselves. Um, and I don't know how they handle these, these particular aspects, but I suspect that it won't be with a permit to operate. It may be with some sort of agreement that we want to bring our vessel to such and such a place and and uh, these are the operating limitations that we propose to place on it and are there any that you want to place on it for that particular deployment? In terms of the, yeah, so the speeds and the, the delay parts and that sort of stuff, it's also, you know, if they're not willing to, 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 to run with them, then it's not going to bring it back into the structural integrity. Sure. In, in, in the case of Armdale's, the, the design producers basically recommended that the, the vessels could actually operate uh, at the top speed of 25 knots uh, up to the top of sea state 4 and, and could operate at 20 knots up to the top of including sea state 7. So that was the you know, based on the sea keeping analysis and you know, based on the recommendation. And so that's that's the design brief that the you know the arm does have or the Royal Australian Navy had. Uh, and that proved to be perhaps a um, little bit too ambitious, you know, here, you know when when some structural issues uh, started occurring then the DMEGL uh, sort of being looked at that speedway that restriction uh, together with the uh, the hostel, and they then made the proposed and amended sort of speed paper restrictions. And up until very recently, and I don't know whether that's been now sort of lifted off, uh, that the vessels are actually operating at a sort of you know restricted speed work by um, a curve now, so which is which is really sort of you know tapered from what that original sort of you know, statement was, but. Uh, the, you know, in the design brief, I have sort of no recollection of uh, any referral to the sort of you know, uh, the high speed code. Uh, they they are in general sort of you know, designed under the DME DME high speed light craft rules. And if you really sort of you know look at deep down, uh, even there, I think you know uh, one can assume that uh, it's not. Adopting the high speed part of it because in the in the DMEGR rules you can actually adopt the high speed and you can actually leave the high speed and you can actually do the design only just as light craft. So um, because yeah, it, it, based on the vertical accelerations, you know, uh, if you actually sort of exceed three G accelerations, then you're about to sort of going to get that high speed light craft 
rules. Um, well, the, the from memory, the chapter on structural requirements in the HSC code is about two pages, and it effectively says that it has to be adequate. Uh, and what is adequate? Well, you're really relying on the, the classification society. If, if it was done uh, with any sort of you know, high speed black craft rules uh, as per the DNVGL or as per the DNV at the time, uh, that, it, that I think you know, it would have been considered all those following crash landing sort of you know, warning and so on, mm. but which appears to be not the case. Yeah. Well, it looks as though we're done. So thanks very much. <laughs>